Okay, well, anyway, they say sex sells, but obviously um, that's fighting against having this at 8.30 in the morning. Um, but thanks for being here, and maybe some more people will drift in, but we'll just start because there are they started running our clock and we have to leave on time and all that, and there is a lot to talk about. Um, I'm going to begin by reading a poem, um, and this is by uh, Philip Larkin, the uh, former poet laureate of, of England. Um, and some of you may know it. It's a famous poem, short, called Annus Mirabilis. Um, do you know it? No? OK, well, you'll like it. Um, sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chatterley Ban and the Beatles' first LP. Up to then, there'd only been a sort of bargaining, a wrangle for the ring, a shame that started at 16 and spread to everything. Then, all at once, the quarrel sank, everyone felt the same, and every life became a brilliant breaking of the bank, a quite unlosable game. So life was never better than in 1963, though just too late for me, between the end of the Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP. Um, so, uh, stating the obvious, Judith was born in 1963, so that proves that sexual intercourse actually began in 1962. Um, <laughs> uh, so he's, he's kidding in saying that. Um, but the reason the, the poem is memorable is it, it sort of gets at something, which is um, although our species has continued and there's only one way that happens. Um, human societies always are built around sets of mores, often very elaborate, around sexual behavior. And in our society, we kind of swing back and forth between a more sort of liberated ideology of sexual behavior and a more restrictive ideology of sexual behavior. Um, so what Larkin is celebrating, a little wistfully, because it was too late for him, is in the 60s, um, the, the pendulum, having swung from liberated back to restrictive, swung back to liberated um, because of uh, a whole bunch of things, including the birth control pill and so on and so forth. Um, so, so the model is that there are these conflicting impulses, and maybe we'll get into this. I don't. It's kind of stating the obvious the case for each. Um, but uh, right now, it seems to me, we're in a very confused moment in the United States where you see the pendulum swinging in both directions at the same time, if you will. That is, uh, you know, we live in um, a dorm, essentially, at Columbia University. And the whole conversation is about creating codes of sexual conduct and so on. That's the big issue at our campus and many other campuses and around much of the country. So that would make it seem like the pendulum is swinging in the restrictive direction. But on the other hand, there's lots of evidence out there. The one that's getting a lot of buzz this week is uh, an article in Vanity Fair called Dating Apocalypse, if anybody's seen that. Um, well, go look. <laughs> it's very interesting and controversial. That, that sort of posits that there's an extreme ethic of liberation going on around apps like Tinder, or enabled by apps like Tinder, you know, so-called hookup culture. So I guess my question to you, Judith, is uh, what's going on here? It seems like there's sort of two contradictory trends that, were, that are happening at the same time instead of the familiar back and forth pendulum swing. Please clear this up for us. <laughs> Well, I could give you a long, convoluted historical explanation. I think sort of tracing the liberationist impulse from the 60s will simultaneously the kind of, uh, kind of successive civil rights movements that morphed into identity political movements, uh, which tend to, while having incredibly salutary effects, tend to emphasize victimhood. So when you could say there's sort of the sexual liberation that came from the advent of the birth control that morphed into a hookup culture, and then another trend which has morphed into victim culture. So that's one way of understanding it. But I think it's much more complicated than that. I think that the sort of 
concern about the, 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 the explosion of conversations about campus rape uh -huh. and rape in general and the need to create new rules to prevent rape uh, has to, is a kind of reaction to hookup culture. Well, let, let's slow you down for a minute. Okay. So, I actually have spent the last few years on the space shuttle and I just got back. Uh -huh. What is hookup culture and when <laughs> did it start? And it, please explain. <laughs> well, there's a debate about whether it actually exists, but I think it does exist. There's some evidence. You know, there are those who say it's just a media phenomenon, just right? Just tell us what is it. Okay, what it is. It's the idea that uh, everyone should be free to have commitment-free relationships sex, you know, without, uh, without emotional engagement, um, and women as well as men are happy to engage in this culture. Um, so we see it on campus and we hear about it from students, uh, which is just that, you know, everybody is just having sex and then not sort of calling each other afterwards. Okay. <laughs> and and this is a good thing. People like it. It works for them. Where did it? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a there's a, a friend of ours, Hannah Rosen, wrote a book called The End of Men, in which she argues that in fact this is great for women because it allows them to get through college without getting dragged down into relationships. That that's what the women she interviewed on campus told her. So that's one argument that it's good for women. I don't agree, <laughs> based on anecdotal evidence and a couple studies that that I've read. I think that women mostly feel done to by hookup culture, and men claim to enjoy it. Uh, they tell interviewers they enjoy it, but I don't actually necessarily think that's always true. And I think it feels more exploitative to women, but I think it's also can be exploitative, feel exploitative by uh, men can also feel exploited by it. When did it start, and why did it start? I don't know exactly when it started. I mean, people started talking about it like... You guys probably know the answer to yeah, this better than right, we right. do. We, we need to. We need to in here. Uh, Never heard of it, right? <laughs> yeah, move in. We need to. I mean, I started hearing about it about a decade ago. Um, anyone else have a, have a longer time span on this? Um, Tom Wolfe wrote a book more than 10 years ago called Hooking Up. True. And I thought it was just he had become an eccentric, basically, because... I had never heard about this, but now that well, we, that's when he was writing *A Man in Full* that he wrote that piece, right? Wasn't no, he was writing the, the the campus book *Charlotte Simmons*. Oh, *Charlotte Simmons*, that's right. Um, and and he did this little book called *Hooking Up*. So and that's twenty years ago. Yeah, that's twenty years ago, and um, I thought, what is he talking about? Well, but now become, that we live on a campus, right? He'd become a giant right winger. So whatever he had to say about campus life sounded like mm -hmm. an old man's alarmism. It didn't. It didn't ring true, but and and I too dismissed a lot of what was in okay, Charlotte. Okay, so but Center. but let's ask it the other way, and I'll, then we'll go back to campus rape. So, it was always possible for people to have hookup culture going back to, you know, we even see it described obliquely in the Bible and so on. So why why did it sort of if it happened twenty years ago or ten years ago, why did it happen? When where do we see it described obliquely in the Bible? Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, all right, fine. <laughs> um, all right. No, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know discussions of sexual practices in the Bible if you read cl closely. Okay, so, fine. Um, and so what was your question again? My question is, what made hookup culture happen? Um. <clears throat> In other words, when we meet, talk to students, they say things like, um, you know, oh, I'm just too busy to have relationships. Right. Is that, cause that, is that really true? I felt like I was busy when I was in college, yet I could have relationships. So what's going on here? What's making this happen? I don't have an answer. Do you have an answer? Uh, well, let me put a hold on it, and we'll come back to that, okay? okay? All right, now, so that's hookup culture, but we agree that it exists to some greater or lesser extent. Um, now let's talk about rape and rape culture. Mm -hmm. where, what is that and where did it come from? Uh, rape culture, I feel, is, uh, I, think it's, I think this is something, again, I would hope that the students uh, in the room would, would, would share their views on this with me, <laughs> but um, because this is something that gets widely bandied about on campus um, is something you can't really question. Uh, recently, uh, so, uh, there was an incident at Brown University that I wrote about where a woman uh, was speaking on campus debating another feminist, and she was a quote-unquote rape culture denialist, and she was protested. People had to set up safe spaces to deal with her talk and things like that. So it's, it's, 
it's a term that can't be questioned that we let, live let in a rape again, culture. I understand. Wait, wait, I'm getting let me there. Go back and I'm be getting a there. More I'm going to say what rape culture okay. is. Okay. I'm good. I'm getting there. Okay. I, I really am. Um, so the idea behind rape, uh, the term, is that we live in a society where it is taken for granted that uh, uh, it is okay to use women, and and um, it, it, every it's sort of the the notion behind it is that. <clears throat> Our society valorizes a kind of aggressive sexuality that is tantamount to or borderline to rape, uh, and that that's just lurking around the corner at every minute. And that is you, it lurking for men too, or just women? Mostly for women, but gay men, you know, it's sort of lurking for them. In other words, they're they're always on the verge of being victimized. Um, now, do I agree that we live in a rape culture? You didn't ask me that. Do you want me to answer that? Well, no, because I don't think you, you did a good enough job of just being super concrete about this for those who have been on the space shuttle or whatever. Okay. All um, right. The notion is we live in a patriarchy, right? Wait, let me try. Okay. okay. You try. Um, there has been a series of incidents that are quite well publicized on campus and no, none more well publicized than the one on our campus involving a young woman named Emma Stalkowitz. Have you all? Heard of her, the person who carries a mattress around? Well, no longer, and, but she and, did. And she graduated. She carried the mattress at graduation, and now she's carrying it somewhere other than Columbia. No, she's donated her mattress to a museum. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, in this series of incidents, which have led to a lot of publicity, a lot of lawsuits, um, action by the federal government, um, this setting up of kind of new offices to deal with this problem at many, many campuses, including Columbia's. Um, I don't want to overgeneralize, but this isn't rape as in, I was walking down the street and a guy with a knife jumped out of the shadows. This is rape uh, where two people are in some sort of stage of a mating dance um, and something goes, and often alcohol or drugs are involved, and something goes very awry, at least from the standpoint of one of the people involved. And, and um, so it's, it's, I guess, what you generally call acquaintance rape. And there's this whole kind of language that has come up in campuses and statistics you hear, like one in five or one in four women on campuses has been raped. Um, uh, that there are these guys called predators who go around raping um, super predators. Super predators, um, and 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 then this is starting to sort of go out into the non-campus legal culture as well. So so that's what you know. That's what I mean about just delineating what the rape epidemic is. Well, that's different from rape culture. Rape culture is not just an idea that you hear that, which is that you know, a definition of the world in which we move. And right. the rape campus rape epidemic is yeah, something that uh, people began to talk about after these studies came out. Right. Yes. Can I just add one quick thing? Sure. Uh, my daughter, who's 32 now, lives in Brooklyn, did an internship years ago at the Sexual Assault Crises and Something Center for a couple summers. And they worked on all these studies. And at that time, showed me the statistics of um, the athletes um, right. and it was like it was like 80% of the campus rapes and all these things going on were coming from guys who you know felt they owned the planet and had the right to do yeah. it. Yeah, many of these cases and involve athletes. All, a whole culture, you know. Yeah. Right. The best so known of these is around uh, right. scholastically but they right. were given all kinds of right. Yeah, the famous one now is is the the Florida State quarterback Jameis Wilson, um, who's who who was you know much publicized for being in one of these cases. But you have been publicly skeptical about this whole line of thinking. Um, why? Um, I don't deny that there is a problem with athletic culture on campus. I would I would I would agree with that. But. The studies that show that one in four, one in five women on campus uh, will be raped are, <clears throat> they're sort of shocking because that, that just means that, you know, one out of four women that you, know, that you meet on campus will be raped. What does rape mean? P 
part of one of these studies, at least, is an artifact of a definition of rape that has vastly expanded to what we generally think of it and involves everything from unwanted sexual touching to the guy who jumps out of the shadows with the knife. So it's this incredible span, um, and it gets, because the studies don't actually use the word rape. That's a media term. They use the word sexual assault. And we sexual are, assault... Or unwanted sexual contact. Well, contact unwanted sexual contact is within... Gender-based misconduct. Well, that, those are the terms that the, the, the Title IX offices are using, right? I uh -huh. mean, I don't think anybody really says unwanted sexual misconduct, they say. But they, the term is sexual assault. And sexual assault is defined as everything from groping to actual really violent, aggressive rape. And so when you talk about that, then it, you know, these, then one, it makes sense that one in four, one in five uh, people will have experienced that. Um, and it's, it's terrible, but it is, it is, it's questionable whether that kind of conduct, the conduct on the sort of less egregious end of the spectrum, warrants, for example, expulsion or suspension, which it has, it has been, uh, it, those, those sanctions have been imposed on people found responsible for unwanted sexual so, touching. So let me slow you down again. So, so let's, the notion that there is this problem or epidemic, mm -hmm. you can say there's a series of um, remedies. Mm -hmm. Some of them are prospective and some of them are retrospective. Mm -hmm. So tell us first, what are the prospective remedies? Well, the prospective remedies are education, which seems like a wonderful thing. Uh, it, these, these, these seminars that uh, first-year students get when, uh, that, that teach them about yes means yes and no means no. That, that, that well, tell us what consent is. Right. So there's this whole battle going on about what is consent. Is consent uh, you know, an explicit verbal or gestural yes? You or have even written on a mobile. <laughs> Well, that, that's kind of a joke. I mean, there are actually people who have designed consent apps, but I, I don't believe they're actually being used. Um, uh, so that's, that's one depth. That's called affirmative consent, right? That's, that's the notion. And that's what's taught in these sexual respect classes, uh, that you, you have to ask permission and get permission before you can move ahead from every, in, along the spectrum of sexual activity or the, the journey towards sexual intercourse. Um, and then there's what had been up till recently the definition of consent, which is, you know, as long as nobody was saying no, 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 it was okay to proceed. Um, so that's one of the debates going on about what is consent. And that's one of the things they teach in, in the sexual respect classes and, and one of the things that, that uh, is a prospective <coughs> remedy, right? And several states have passed consent laws, right? Um, consent laws really vary. <coughs> Two states have passed affirmative consent laws. All states have no mean no, no means no laws. Right. I mean, in the criminal code, not just on campus. A few states are now toying with affirmative consent. Have actually, it hasn't been written, but uh, courts have interpreted statutes to mean affirmative consent, and so that is the dominant interpretation. However, no no court of of law has actually ever. Uh, sent anyone to jail for violating affirmative consent, it just gets sort of la layered on top of other, uh, other uh, charges. So nobody has gone to jail just for not, not getting affirmative consent. Just to, just to explain how core, just as an example, the famous Emma Sokowitz case, the mattress girl, she was engaged, I won't get too specific, in a consensual sexual act with a man. Then during the act, the man did something non-consensual, and, and, and so that's the core of her, of her case. It wasn't, you know, again, it, it was a sort of step-by-step -step issue around he went from consensual to non-consensual. You had a hand. Yeah, so I'm getting to, let me put a hold on that, because I'm coming to that soon. But I wanted to cover one other thing before we go back to that. Um, uh, so we're, we're going there, don't worry. Um, so now let's, that's the prospective, all these consent regimes and respect seminars. I mean, if you work on a campus, as I do, you have to go through these trainings and, you know, so on and so forth around this. Even faculty, even, even deans. Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. Um, every single person does. Um, Are the students required? Yes, yes, yes. yes not yes. only at Columbia, where we, where we live, not only do they get it in the first year, but they get refresher courses every year. Yeah, I mean, from the campus perspective, it's kind of like, remember, 
some of us are old enough to remember the old parietal rules. Is that ancient history? Who could be in whose room when, after what hours? How many feet hours? had to be on the floor? Yeah, how many feet had to be on the floor? There was a big set of rules. Um, and then that all went away, and this is sort of a new attempt to enact a set of university and college-based rules of behavior around sex after a generation of trying not having any. So that goes back to your question. But one more thing I want to cover before we get to that. So that's all the prospective. Retrospective, after this happens, if you could talk a little bit about the whole adjudication, hearing procedure, mm -hmm. punishment, et cetera, how does that happen? Well, every college had a kind of ad hoc procedure. They just sort of, they dealt with it as they saw fit um, until uh, the, the Title IX, the, uh, the Department of Education uh, is governed by, you know, an act called Title IX, which is supposed to guarantee equal access for women uh, to education. And uh, there's another one, Title VII, which is equal access for minorities. And that used to, we all used to think of that as, as sort of equal access to athletic facilities, right, and, and sports and and various other things. And then in the late 90s, it started to be interpreted as um, freeing women from the burden of sexual harassment and assault. And so over time, the, the, Department, the Office for Civil Rights of the Department of Education started advising campuses to really, really step up their, their sort of adjudication processes so that it was fair to women, right? And it was, in, it, it was easier for women to complain to their there, it, it would become easier and less of a shaming process to complain to people on campus, uh, authority figures on campus, that, and explain what had happened to them and, and get justice. Um, Let me interject I'm for not, a minute. Okay. Columbia University, just to pick on my own university, uh, gets over a billion dollars a year in federal aid. Uh, so when the federal government says, you know, we're kind of stressing out about this, that letter gets opened. <laughs> Yes. No. In so other that, words, yes, I was, get, I was getting clear. to the, the famous Dear Colleague yeah, letter. So. so, right. So this is all tied to federal funding. If you violate Title IX as a university, you are at risk. This has never actually happened, although it almost happened last year uh, with Rutgers. Um, if you violate, are found to be in violation of Title IX and you don't quickly fix it uh, to the satisfaction of the Office of Civil Rights, you can lose your federal funding. So. About four years ago, the, the Office of Civil Rights sent out a letter saying, uh, we, uh, we want every campus to change its procedures. Some campuses had higher standards of evidence for a finding of guilty. They don't say guilty, they say responsible. Than others, we want all of them to drop it to a, to a standard called preponderance of evidence. That means 51% chance that it happened, uh, you know, as opposed to 49% chance that it didn't happen, which is very low. Uh, and. Um, uh, we need another a, a set of we need a bunch of procedures which make it easier and easier for the victim to come forward and complain and not feel like survivor for, for the survivor right to come forward they, they don't use that language uh, legally to come forward she, she shouldn't be cross-examined uh, she can be anonymous it's uh, it, it has been up until quite recently always a she there's one famous uh, gay homosexual gay case at Brandeis uh, that's about it. There aren't very many of those. Um, so the victim doesn't have to confront uh, the assailant. The victim doesn't have to even identify herself if she doesn't want to. A number of procedures which do absolutely make it easier for victims to come forward, but probably strip away some layer of protection for somebody accused of rape. So that person doesn't have the right to confront somebody accusing him of something. Nobody, uh, nobody in the process has a right to a lawyer. Uh, Remember, these are cases with no physical evidence and no well, eyewitnesses. Always. Often, no. Often, but not always. It's a he said, she I said. I mean, there's some truly sometimes months after the fact. Well, no, those are the no. Let, let me, let me, let me stop you there. That is not true. Okay, those are the famous cases, and there are plenty of those. There are also going to be cases of egregious abuse, yeah. which those have helped to. Adjudicate. I have a problem with the, with with that too, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. But what you're talking about are the the cases that in which uh, uh, some guy has been expelled from campus and has filed a lawsuit, right. and then we can all all of these are under you know total laws of privacy and total laws of confidentiality. So you don't know what most of the cases are. The ones where somebody has been expelled and filed a lawsuit, all of this he he tells his story, all kinds of evidence is on the record. 
And those tend to be those cases. So those are the famous cases. The problem I have with the really egregious cases where, where something really horrible happens is that I don't think universities should be dealing with those. Um, so one of the things that this, 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 this famous letter, of, uh, it's called the Dear Colleague Letter of 2011, one of the things that this letter said is you must, university must set up its own separate procedure. You cannot simply refer this to the police. It must have a procedure at the risk of losing federal funding. And though you are always allowed to complain to the police as well as to your campus, um, and the campus was never allowed to say you don't go to the cops, there was a kind of de facto assumption that, that, that the university could handle it better. There's sort of, as a result of setting up this process, hiring people to deal with it, there was a, often a kind of uh, sense that we'll take, they communicated to the student, we'll take care of it, you don't have to go to the cops, that will be an onerous and unpleasant experience. So in the cases of real abuse, uh, I personally have a problem with, with universally handling them uh, alone and not sort of simultaneously involving the cops because you may in fact have, you know, a predatory rapist on your campus and that person probably should be dealt with through the criminal justice system. So, um, so my critique, though you didn't ask me about my critique, but my critique of this is on the one hand, you're setting up a quasi-judicial system without due process for the accused, which as a civil libertarian I have a problem with. And on the other hand, you're not necessarily or insisting on getting the criminal justice system involved when there really is criminal activity going on. So there have been a number of cases that have gotten a lot of publicity where men have been expelled from universities while protesting that they didn't do anything wrong. Right. right. Okay, so now let's go to your question, which is sort of core to a lot of this, is, um, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning about the pendulum swings, um, I would have thought that what you'd be seeing now, and maybe this is how it'll net out, is people saying, okay, we went to a sort of, the pendulum swung in a very liberationist direction, AKA hookup culture. And as has happened every time in history when that happened before, various negatives associated with that pop up, including campus rape and other things. So the pendulum swings back um, into a more restrictive direction. Um, and then we discover all the problems with that and it swings back. What has surprised me in this moment is um, I don't hear anybody saying, let's swing the pendulum back. And in, and, and in particular, in the feminist conversation, which is where you, you might expect that would come from, um, every article, every blog post has you know, what we call in journalism a to be sure paragraph. And the to be sure paragraph says, to be sure, I 100% believe in casual sex. Casual sex is fabulous. But, Da, 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 da. You're exaggerating. Um, You're exaggerating. But you know, I am exaggerating for effect. But I, I, I haven't seen any voices saying, "Let's just swing the pendulum back." We went too far in the liberation. Where would direction. you swing the pe pendulum back to exactly? What to to what moment and to what set of sexual mores? Well, okay, so I'm old, right? When I was a young lad, uh, roughly speaking, um, if I can get quasi clinical, there was this sort of unwritten rule that you didn't have to, my parents, you were supposed to wait till marriage, okay? That wasn't me. The unwritten rule was you can have sex on the third date, but not the first date or the second date. And then after you have sex on the third date, you're in, quote, a relationship. So if you have sex on the third date and you're the guy, and you then after the act is consummated, you say to the other person, oh, by the way, get out, I never want to see you again, I'm never going to call you again. That's a huge moral wrong. So I thought that was actually, I mean, not that people didn't have all sorts of sorrows and horrors around things going wrong in their love and sex lives. I wouldn't mind going back to that standard. You I mean, maybe that's just a typical. You wouldn't like, mind oh, your daughter having that standard. I would totally not mind my daughter having that standard. Okay. So what's wrong with that? Why isn't that the answer? Um, Why aren't we seeing that in the conversation? How did we how did we move to you got to have sex on the first date? Is that what you're asking? Or or it's not even a date. Right on the first it's, encounter. The, you, it's not like let's meet, let's have a meal. Right. Then you know it's like on first encounter at a party. Right. And and why isn't anybody saying that itself 
needs to be kind of reeled back? Well, I mean, look, I agree with you that there needs to be more of an ethos <laughs> of mutual respect. So let's just say that. But I do think that I agree that you, you do have in the feminist conversation a sense that you must retain the notion that women have a right to sexual agency, right? Mm -hmm. they, they have the right to have casual sex if they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I think women insist on that is because the, the, res the restraint that was shown was supposed to be enforced by the woman, right? And if she didn't enforce it, she was a slut, mm -hmm. right? And we don't want to go back to that moment sort of where anyone who violates, any, any time that rule, these rules are violated, it is the girl or the woman who bears the onus of the shame. That's not okay. So that's why I think you get this sex positive argument. Now, um, what you don't have is the conversation saying what's going on in this regimen of casual sex is women are getting screwed over in, in, in some senses. That women are not happy. Sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Women are, uh, women are not feeling uh, respected by this, by this process of having a lot of casual sex. Now, I do think that women, most women I know, are capable of saying no. Uh, but it is true that, you know, so again, going back to the anecdotal evidence of young women we know on, on, at Columbia University, they feel that if they're saying no, they are running the risk of not getting into any relationships. But the irony, the sort of tragic twist that they have to deal with is if they say yes, they're not, going to get in, they're not necessarily going to get into a relationship either, and they feel sort of abused by this. So I think, I think that's something that is not sufficiently being talked about. The problem is, you know, how do you go back to uh, a set of sexual mores that don't put the whole burden on the, on the woman to enforce? Right. And I think that's why we're getting into this idea that, well, well, you know, we can't solve this culturally, so we're going to have our institutions solve it for us. We're going to have our colleges create sets of rules. We're going to have the criminal defense code include these rules, uh, it, it, you know, that, that, are, that you know, are surprising to someone of my generation because, frankly, I think of sex as complicated, ambiguous. I don't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily, I'm married now, so I don't have to deal with this, but... Uh, I wouldn't, if I were out on the sexual marketplace in the dating scene, I would not necessarily always want to have to say yes, 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 because that's just not how sex happens. It's much, it's much murkier, it's much more confusing. I wrote an article about uh, how this idea of affirmative consent or yes means yes is moving into the criminal code and what might be the problems with that. And one of the com somebody who wrote a comment on it said that she was the mother of uh, a young woman dating uh, dating a lovely young man, son of two college professors, who had really drummed into his head the idea that he must ask permission for every step of the way. And and this woman reported that one day her daughter had said to her, "Mom, I kind of just said to the guy, you know what? When I don't want you to do something, I'll say no. Stop, stop asking yes for permission all the time. It's driving me insane." Um, I don't think sex really proceeds that way. So um, I think that we're trying to implement uh, rules uh, that have penalties, really serious penalties for violation, not just shaming, which is bad, right? But you, if you're shamed, you're not being kicked out of college, right? You're not, being, you're not being labeled for life as a sexual offender. It's bad and it stinks, but it's not, it's not life destroying in the way that being convicted of sexual misconduct on campus or off can really destroy a life. So I, I think that moving into the realm of the law, deeply problematic, but I think the reason we're doing it is because we can't solve it culturally. So just a, one or two more questions, and then we'll go to interactive mode. Um, I guess um, what I sense is there's a sort of disconnect as I read it. Like there was this Vanity Fair article which is written by a woman journalist, is very sort of sensationalized about all these tales of hookups on Tinder, et cetera. Um, and, you know, go read it. I won't provide the salacious details. There was a lot of negative reaction in the feminist blogosphere, um, essentially along the lines you were describing. There was one post where the woman says, hey, you know, I use men like tissue paper, and I love it. You know, don't make, don't, 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 you know, these defenses of Tinder-based, you know what Tinder is, right? It's an app, uh, Tinder-based hookup culture by feminists. Um, but then when you read the lawsuits, the various journalistic accounts, the memoirs, et cetera, 
they, they, they just, there's even one academic study that's fairly careful of this. There seems to be this kind of finding that women fare worse in this culture than men do. So my last question to you, and it's the toughest question, is are women and men built differently emotionally around sex? Is there just a difference there? So well, you if have... I were an evolutionary psychologist, the answer would be very clear, right? Yes. Uh, I am not an evolutionary psychologist. Uh, I don't think I am able to, to separate out the strands of sort of, you know, are women built, built neurologically and, and hormonally, endocrinologically differently than men around this very intimate act? You know, the, the evolutionary psychological argument is women invest a great deal in reproduction, right? Nine months our calories, our energy, our time, our finances, you know, the, the repercussions of sex are much bigger for women than for men, so therefore women demand more attachment. That's what evolutionary psychology says. To what degree are we socialized to demand more emotional involvement, and to what degree are we biologically predisposed? I simply am not equipped to answer. Um, but, you know, we are socialized, and maybe we are biologically predisposed Yes, women are different. Uh, how different and in what way, I, I can't say. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I, for, let me just say, you, there's still slut shaming going yeah. on. There's still a way men, men talk about women that, that women sort of eavesdrop on and are disgusted by. And uh, you know, there are still these kind of repercussions for a woman that, that do not exist for a man. And I think that is why, that is, that is another reason why women might feel sort of done to by this culture. And I would say, you know, I personally think uh, that, that this culture is actually harmful to men as well as women. I mean, there's this way, I mean, it sort of has an opposite, leaving aside the biology, social aspect. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you all, males in the audience don't have to agree or disagree, but I would posit that every man at least goes through a phase in life, and the phase never ends, and they're like 13 or 14 years old, the sort of port noise complaint sweet spot, when they believe that, gee, if I could have, you know, infinite numbers of sexual partners in quick encounters, that is what I would really like my love life to be like. That would be paradise. And that's just a really stupid idea, um, you know, and, and, and it, it sort of takes sexual intimacy into the, the zone where it's almost indistinguishable from masturbation. Um, and, and, uh, or exploitation. Yeah, or exploitation or both. Yeah. And so, so the, the mistake men make is, you know, not really, it's, it's often hard for a lot of men to get that this situation that we're sort of taught is, you know, paradise actually isn't. Um, and, and um, you know, it just, it's, it, so I, I don't think it works that well for men either in the sense that it sort of pushes on this button that says, Guys, what you've always dreamed of, what you've always wanted, it has arrived, and so it's very. But no, and that actually no, that's not what I want. You know, there's no conversation around telling men this isn't what you really. Well, I want. mean, if you sat in on one of those sexual respect classes, I think you'd hear that, mm -hmm. right? But How, to what degree does this actually alter male behavior on campus or off? I don't know. And one thing I just want to say before we end, another critique I have about. The the conversation about campus rape is that all the studies show that uh, women are raped in far greater numbers off campus than on. Right, so it's the the 18 to 25 year old women who are who are who are most susceptible to sexual violence are the ones who can't afford to go to college right. or don't go to college, and that's we're, we're just rape. not talking about that. And why aren't we talking about that? Why is the focus entirely on these privileged women who get to go to college. So that, that just drives me crazy from a sort of class perspective. Anyway, okay. So questions, comments, in, interactions? I'm glad that you said that. I know society-wise, sexual encounters are intense. I mean, I have a big voice. Yeah. I, they're very <laughs> intense. So I am, um, I'm glad that you said that. But the thing is respect. I don't see the respect. And 
media and the internet is teaching us what sex is. Right. Right. Yeah, so we haven't that. even mentioned, by the way, you feel, you sense, there's some statistic, I don't know if this is statistic or urban legend, 40% of all internet activity is watching porno. You heard that? Yeah. Um, and it's not sort of mentioned, but in the background as you read through all these accounts and lawsuits and stories and so on, there's this sort of underlayer of porn, you know, as sitting in everybody's head as they enter into intimate life. You don't even need life. to be watching porn. Uh, um, I mean, maybe the, I, I'm, I'm the mother of two preteens, you know, and no, it one is, teen. well, one, one just turned 13, but uh, it is always shocking to me that when you go to a PG-13 movie with them, as they pressure you relentlessly to do, you're watching really explicit sex, right? Not just violence, and very explicit violence, more of that, but really explicit sex, and you're thinking, wait, I'm, this is really embarrassing, I don't want to be in the theater with my son watching this. It's all there. It's all in their face to a degree that is unbelievable. You say, okay, fine, you can watch this primetime sitcom on Netflix. And then you're listening in and you're just thinking, it's foul language, it's jokes about explicit sex. And maybe they're not showing the act, but they're talking about it nonstop. They're talking about whores. They're talking, you know, it's just shoved in people's face. And that's, I actually think that's what people really mean by rape culture, is this idea that our pop culture is so sexually explicit, and I just think it, 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 is, it is oppressive. I mean, another thing I was very struck by, we have, uh, he has two older sons and I helped raise them, and I was very struck not having encountered children for a long time when I entered their lives, how prudish they and all their friends were. So people do not change in changing rooms anymore, right? They do not strip in changing rooms. Like when I grew up and went to camp, we all took off our clothes and marched off to the showers, right? Nobody does that anymore, and I think there's a kind of prudery that comes from feeling assaulted by this imagery. So, you know, so, so I agree with you. It's, it's, it's in the culture, and however many sexual respect classes you, you take or are forced to take, you know, it's, it's just like this compared to this, you know, absolutely. Yes. What do you think the relationships will look like? I mean, when they're in their middle age, 40s, that kind of thing? Yeah, Which... I'm wondering if there'll be more non-monogamy, um, you know, more, yeah. you know, change in, are they not going to get married? Like, what is that, this um, hookup culture going to evolve to well, as, they, as they age? Let me say a couple things, and then Judith will say a couple things. Just demographically, so I'm not going to sort of predict, but just, just things that are showing up in the data. Um, First, uh, you know, we're 50 years exactly now, plus one month, from the famous Moynihan Report in 1965 about the black family. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of. Um, but at that time, you, you had statistics showing that African Americans had much, much higher out-of-wedlock birth rate, r rates than whites. Now that's evened out by race very strongly, but not by class. So you're finding the connection between marriage and childbirth significantly loosened in the U.S. and other developed nations, um, and, and it increases as you go down the income scale. So that's, that's a kind of, I don't know if that's related to hookup culture, but that's what's already happening. And then I'll throw that to you to say what'll, what'll it look like in a generation. Well, I mean, already, so, yeah, so in America, the poorer you are, the less likely you are to get married, right? And so we're really, marriage is kind of becoming a perquisite of, uh, a privilege of the well-to-do. Uh, so that's, that's already happening. Um, in Europe, uh, among the well, you know, among, among, in the upper, middle to upper classes, marriage is already becoming pretty rare, actually. Uh, people definitely pair up, they stay together while they raise their children, but they just don't get married. Um, so I, Such I, as uh, Francois Hollande. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I do think that marriage is sort of slowly going away. Um, uh, ironically, as we, we, we expand the scope of what marriage is, I think that sort of, you know, uh, what we used to think of as marriage is sort of quietly disappearing. Um, to what degree it will disappear, I don't know. 
I don't actually think, I think people go through this, I think, I think the kind of sexual activity we're talking about, the reason everyone's focused on the 18 to 25 year old segment, is that's when you're experimenting, right? That's when you're moving from the parental regime to something else and you're trying out new things. And I think, I guess I think eventually uh, people will pair off and, and, you know, because they have to raise children and so on and so forth. But, you know, rates of divorce continue to rise and, and, and you know, marriage is sort of slowly When they're in away. their 40s and 50s, will they have the energy to have hookup culture if <laughs> no, they want to? of course not. So, will they maybe have simultaneous relationships at the same time while they're I, I, I don't see it. I have no idea. I don't know what the data are. I have no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not encountering it, but I don't know. Other questions, comments? Well, I'm just going to say one thing that, um, you know, I watch my daughter from maybe, and her posse of girlfriends and, who are in all different economic levels and different ethnicities from their late 20s to the early 30s. And I think, you know, she, I remember my daughter saying, oh, there is this app and you can see who's in the area and you can just, right. you know, and uh, I think one of you mentioned being able to have a relationship in college and do your studies. But I think it hasn't been that way. And I think it's because technology, they're just flooded with so much stuff that they, you know, and we are sexual beings. And at, during that age range, you, you know, have these urge to not necessarily merge and have child, but to merge. And it's an outlet that these, you know, the hooking up, the hooking up, and I, I could see the, all these girls doing these things. But when my daughter got to be 30, then she said, you know, I really feel I want to have a child. And she kind of reflexed back into maybe an imitation of what her parents had right. been doing with a lot of question, question right. marks about the validity and the rightness of, of that kind of a relationship. But then she did get married this year and is now trying to clear her body of whatever antidepressant she took so she can have a child and they can raise a child. And so I'm just, you know, sharing that, right. that I've been really close to that because my daughter would even show me her, you know, match.com and her OkCupid where yeah. she met her Yeah, I mean, husband. to me, one of the, I mean, when I talk to younger people about this, they, they, they always say, um, you know, I'm just too busy. Or they say, when you were young, you knew you were going to get a job after college, but there's so much in economic insecurity that I'm too busy. I don't buy it. I mean, that's kind of like the old story where the person goes to the shrink and says, I can't afford to pay you. You're ripping me off. I'm out of here, you know? So it's just, there's, that's a sort of block to something deeper that, that's going on, I think, that, that people find it less comfortable to talk about having to do with some of the stuff that you mentioned. I just, I'm just very skeptical of the idea that people are, quote, too busy to have relationships anymore because of things happening in the American economy. That right, just and to like follow on your question, I just do think people at, at reach a certain age where they want to have children and they, have to, they, they, they recognize the advantages of pairing up and they do pair up. Will that be accompanied by marriage? Not necessarily, right? I think the forms will change. Okay, so our clock is at 15 seconds, so that's a good place to stop. Yeah. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks.